Hi, all. Kenzie Schofield here with the Today for Daily podcast. And I am thrilled over the moon. We got our hands on NT Lawyer. Um, you are absolutely notorious, absolutely fabulous with Crazy Days and Nights. Um, for anyone unfamiliar, Crazy Days and Nights, you've been so ahead of the Harry and Meghan game. Um, it was all the way back in 2018 that you reported that Meghan Markle was going full diva you say, lucky for us, complains to her friends that she doesn't get enough respect and that she only wants to go to fun events. She is convinced every one of the staff hates her. They probably do. It wouldn't shock me if they end up moving to a different country for a couple of years. Oh, my gosh. She is going to ask. She would love to live in Canada for a few years. <sighs> NT, what a prediction. My God, you were on the money. Yeah. You know, thanks for having me. Um. Yeah, you know, one of the things that's really tough about royal, you know, gossip or whatever, and <clears throat> is that prior to Megan being there, I think that anybody would say, oh, yeah, I heard this, I heard this. You really didn't hear anything because the royal family, there was no gossip to be had, especially for, you know, a Los Angeles based gossip blogger. Yeah. But when Meghan Markle enters the picture, then it adds a whole bunch of other people that all of a sudden you can get some more information from especially back then, you know, when she was with hanging out with Jessica Mulroney and then Jessica had friends and stuff. And so then it becomes a little bit easier to get actual royal gossip. And, you know, the, the trend has continued. You're so you're so right. But uh, what I really <laughs> took away from this was you say that she's convinced the staff dislikes her. This is all the way back in 2018. We've heard the rumors of her feeling like she didn't get enough respect. I mean, Tom Quinn, who's a really respected royal author, discusses how, you know, part of the reason she was so resentful towards the staff is because she felt like she was lower on the totem pole. She should have been treated the same as, as Catherine, the Princess of Wales. So that, I mean, just that right there, that to me is gives it gives that story credibility on on top of that you use the word diva and that's always been my my point about Meghan Markle I don't think that race really plays a, a hand in this as much as her just being kind of a pain in the butt um you know and and so to me I I read that and I thought my goodness you were on it when did Meghan first hit your hit your radar was it before Harry was it after Harry when do you remember hearing the name Meghan Markle I mean, you would hear about it when she was on Suits, but you got to realize that even when she was on Suits, that, you know, I get a lot of gossip tips and everything all the time, but she wasn't the most important person on Suits. So, you know, if you're going to write a blind about somebody on Suits, it was it would be somebody else rather than Megan. And because nobody really knew who she was, unless you watch Suits, which was on USA and, you know, had really low ratings, not necessarily for USA, but in the overall scheme of things, then people are like, I have no idea who she is. Yeah. So <clears throat> they would know who, you know, maybe like it was generally about like the lead actors and how they started off being nice guys. And then when they got on suits and all of a sudden, Oh my gosh, I'm a big star, but you're really not a big star. You're filming in Ontario and nobody knows who you are unless they're watching the show. And <clears throat> I think Megan had always um, had eyes on trying to, move up the ladder kind of thing in the sense that is she going to be stuck doing suits forever? And don't forget that prior to that, she had been um, a briefcase person, right. you know? Um, so on deal or no deal. So it was kind of, you know, that's not exactly a, a list kind of stuff. Right. That might, yes. Cause I've actually heard you say recently. Um, I mean, I don't know how recently was I listened to a podcast rec recently with you on it where you said sometimes you get tips about people that aren't necessarily A-listers. They very well could be submitting them, them themselves or they've asked their publicist to do so. And it's not something you would instantly put on the site. You might put that away in a folder just in case something does come to fruition with their career. So very smart of you. Um, uh, Demois asked you for the short version, but I once... Once I heard her say, give me the short version, I died a little inside. I want the long version. How would you describe the Harry and Meghan saga as an entertainment professional? I think that, you know, I've been, if you had asked me a year ago whether or not that they were going to get divorced, I would have said no. I would have said, mm, I don't really see that happening. I just think that 
but things were different a year ago, right? They had just had their documentary on Netflix and it, it did really well. And, you know, we still had Spare was still in the horizon. And I just, I there was enough milking left to do of Harry's past and stuff that I said, oh, I don't, I don't think they're going to get divorced. But over the past year, you know, I've been probably on the, the bandwagon that's saying, I see a split. And I think it's because of the fact that they have definitely gone their ways professionally. They're mm-hmm. separate. Like Harry's not represented by William Morris. It's Megan. Right. So they're doing deals basically for Megan and trying to find her things to do. Harry, yes, a little bit under the Archwell kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the most part, no. I this this Africa documentary he's doing, I it's not being repped by WME. And the Invictus thing is already, you know, in the can or whatever for Netflix, which I have gone on record saying, I think it's a really good idea. I think it's going to be very popular and I have no problem with it at all. I think that it's a story that should be told. And I think that he should be very proud of the fact that he was involved in that from the very beginning. And that is something that I think that somehow he lost sight over. And I want to say, and this is something you'll see from, from time to time, and I don't really use the term very often, but it's basically somebody becomes like a star effer. And I think that Harry, even though he had met famous people, <clears throat> this was like his first chance. Oh my gosh, this is somebody I can see her on TV. And don't forget when they had their relationship and they were dating, it was one of these long distance kind of things. Like he would fly into Ontario and see her for a few days or she would fly into London and see him for a few days. And it's all hotel rooms and rainbows and unicorns. Uh, you have made this point before. I, this is the greatest point. I mean, brilliant, because you are absolutely right. There is an intensity associated with A, a long distance relationship, B, a, like that secrecy of they're going through back entrances. They're on the opposite sides. You know, there's the story of them at the opposite side of the grocery store, you know, trying to not, they didn't want anybody to see them shopping for dinner together, but flirting through the, the like holes in the walls and flirting through uh, their cell phones. That is one of the greatest greatest points in the world that there this was so romantic and this relationship was so intense because you know absence makes the heart grow fonder there was a distance there there was something so sexy about that secrecy and um, on top of that it's a freaking prince i mean this is a girl on suits a pre you know prior to that the briefcase girl dating these you know the most eligible bachelor in the world in secret i love that you've said that And I think that in any kind of like long distance relationship like that, because what you're doing is you're only there for like three or four days. There's not the day to day. um, Oh, you know, if you, if you're dating somebody and you're you're local and you're like, oh yeah, I can't go out tonight. You know, I got to work till whatever. And okay, well, let's grab, you know, something to eat. You know, you want to see a movie or something, or maybe you'll come over or whatever. But the day to day is very much involved in those kind of things. But if you are just there for four days, it's all about sex and eating out and doing that kind of thing. And it it is a very intense kind of relationship. And then think about, he's coming over to see her. He's excited about that, but then she's flying over there and, oh my gosh, I get to be snuck into a palace and all this kind of stuff. I'm like you said, dating a prince and everything. And it's just, it's very intense and it's not real life. Yeah. That is the truth. It's not real life. And, and so when all of this happens and everything, and, and you can see it right away, She's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm dating him. And then she starts cutting herself off from the people that she knew. And from the very beginning, um, especially where I noticed the, this whole, she wants to be better than maybe that she is, is that for the wedding invitations, and I've talked about this before, is that she didn't know George Clooney, but she invited him. She didn't know Reese Witherspoon, but she invited her and Reese Witherspoon was like, I don't know who she is. Why would I go to a wedding of somebody I don't even know? Right. And 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 it was just that kind of thing where if she had been on suits and when she was married to Trevor Engelson, she didn't say, oh, let me invite George Clooney mm-hmm. to my wedding. You know, she didn't know him when she married Harry, but she knew that I could send this out and these people are going to come. These people who would never take my phone calls before, all of a sudden they're going to take my phone calls because I'm with Prince Harry. I also thought I think it was trying to divert 
attention away from the fact that she only had one member of her family there. And it absolutely worked. None of us were like, really? There, no one there? She has no member of her family there? We we're all like, oh, there's Oprah Winfrey. There's George Clooney. Oh my gosh, it's it's Serena Williams. Like all, you know, doughy eyed, excited about all of these American celebrities rolling up to a royal wedding, not thinking, where's her siblings or her dad or her grandpa or her grandmother? I mean, the, the irony that none of us caught on immediately it just, I kick myself. I think that she was probably ashamed or embarrassed of them. I do. I um, do. Too. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure that they probably went to her wedding to Trevor because it was in Jamaica. So it was a destination wedding. So I doubt that they were even there. I really well, don't no, know. No, her, her dad did go. Her dad. Her dad okay. Yeah. And, um, mm. and she, he had taken beautiful photos, uh, but it, like a, a in video of the ceremony, and she demanded that he delete them for some reason, unbeknownst to me. But again, like I don't know, I, I I have I guess that this kind of rolls into my next question or my next series of que- series of questions for you. Do do you know or know of Trevor Ingleson since you're in the in the city? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I know of him. Um, yeah, but he he is. There were a million Trevor Engelsons yeah. okay, in Hollywood. There are a million of them. And there's a people who want to be Trevor Engelsons. And Trevor Engelson, he's had a decent kind of career. But is it A-list now? Is it B-list? Yeah, yeah kind of. Um, you know, he he gets attached to shows. And he's been attached to a couple um, and attached to a movies as producer and stuff. And producer is a very generic title. And unless yeah. you're bringing financing or something like that, yeah. You know, that's generally what a producer will be, somebody who's bringing it all together, or perhaps you just know somebody. And it's a different kind of thing than, say, a producer, let's say, on Suits. You know, originally, you'll have the creator and the showrunner. Well, oftentimes, after the second season or so, the showrunner will get offered a different job, and they're still technically the the showrunner or whatever, executive producer. But what they've done is there will be, let's say, writers from Suits that have written, say, three or four episodes and stuff. And so then they move up and they become a different kind of producer and they move up and they move up and that's how it kind of works. But when you're a movie producer, which is what he did primarily when they started dating and then later he moved into television, but he was never as a writer. It was never as that. It was just kind of, I know somebody, I can do this. I kind of got this job and there was nothing spectacular about his career at all. Um, But maybe back in 2004, when they started dating, you know, she's 23 years old and Hey, I'm a producer. I'm trying to do this. I've got some things lined up and blah, blah, blah. That's the same thing that every guy says to everybody in Hollywood to a try and make girl, an impression. A cute girl in a nightclub. Yeah. With a drink in yeah. her hand. And well, yeah. you have a business card that says producer. Exactly. Well, so I have a, a couple of mutual friends with Trevor and, and, you know, they have suggested to me over the years that in seeing Megan interact with him in those early days, they felt like she was really looking to plug into a boyfriend or a husband that could help her professionally. And what it sounds like to me, A, I'd like to know if you've heard the same, but B, what it sounds like to me is you're saying based on what Trevor is capable of, he was kind of limited in the ways that he was able to help out Megan professionally. Is that, is that, am I interpreting that correctly? Yeah. I mean, hundred percent, unless you're bringing financing, you really don't have a say in the casting and stuff. But yeah. again, you know, she's 23 years old and he says, I'm a producer and Hey, I'm going to, I've got this movie that I'm working on. I'm trying to get it together and helping the people that are financing. And I'm going to be a producer on this movie. And she's saying, great. You know, I can get cast on in this movie, but he doesn't have that kind of pull um, mm-hmm. to do that. But what you're hoping is that something will be successful and that people go, oh, yeah, I was a producer on this movie. And then, you know, I've, I've got a higher profile, somebody else, a bigger agent. And now I got this movie and then you maybe have some pull and you can, you know, have somebody cast in it. And I think that that's what she was thinking is that anytime you're hanging out with a producer and you're an actor or an actress, the idea is that you're hoping that you'll be cast in that. And yeah. it's kind of a a shortcut way of doing it. I mean, a lot of people try and do it, but you know, the proper way in Hollywood is that you you end up with a bunch of friends and stuff. You start out at the the bottom and then you kind of move your way up. And, and an example of this would be somebody like Adam Sandler. So Adam Sandler and David Spade and Rob Schneider, they were all writers and they did comedy and stuff. And then um Schneider and Spade got Saturday Night Live and they're like telling Lauren, hey, bring Adam Sandler. You know, he's great in this. And Adam Sandler went to Saturday Night Live, but he was a writer for the first season. And Judd Apatow was part of that group too. And but they grew up together. And so yeah. then if if somebody becomes famous or it gets that pull and you've been with these people, then you pull them along with you. And everybody does their own little separate things too. But it's all part of the same group and you come together and you'll see it things like in 
you know, um, grownups and stuff where they're all together. And, and, and there's, I'm just using them as an example. However, there's lots of these little groups that start like that. And, but then there's a shortcut. Oh, I'm dating this guy as a producer. He's going to get me cast in this role. And then if it's a big enough role, then hopefully you can move on and you can get something bigger. And I think that that's what she was trying to do at the time. And, and unfortunately she was getting smaller roles as like drunk girl at bar and remember me. And allegedly she was really unhappy with that. Um, no, you're absolutely right. And I, I, I have only found one person from suits that's maybe two that will openly talk about the, you know, Megan being a joy to work with and how to the, you know, at today, at this very moment, I do feel like everybody at the time was like, yeah, she was great. Cause they liked having a camera in their face. Um, but it does seem like less and less people are willing to say that she was a joy to work with on set. Um, and specifically at deal or no deal and Andrew Morton's book, uh, I believe. And in Tom Bauer's book, they both discuss how she really kept to herself and wasn't necessarily friendly with the other people. And it's like you said, it's crucial to be friendly and to, to make friends all over because you never know who's going to give you that helping hand and to give you a, a new opportunity. Um, I did, when I was thinking about asking about Trevor, I thought, wow, it's, Trevor's been so n nice to not say anything. It's been really mature and kind of him to kind of stay in the shadows. But then it occurred to me that he had sold a show to Fox about a girl that dumped a guy for a British prince. Do we have any idea what happened to that show? I mean, he sold it to Fox. However, then he, he kind of pulled it back and he pulled it back in um, May of 2018 um and he said no but the reason was and megan will you know like to say oh i'm i'm the reason you know i convinced him blah 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 but that's not the reason the the reason actually is because trevor hit the jackpot with tracy curland who he's married to and has wow. a couple of kids with and because tracy is the sole heir to a billion dollar fortune uh, so, so he, so he, they don't need that kind of negative attention is what you're saying. They are like t totally loved up financially set and they didn't want to like bring on the kind of attention that a project like that would attract. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, there's just no point in it for him. You know, he can do his, his television show and be a producer. And right now it's just kind of him just, Oh, you know, if I want to do something, I can do something, but uh, you know, I'm married to somebody because her dad died in 2021 uh, so it's just the mom and then her and then if mom dies. So, I mean, it's like, a. I mean, he has more money than he would ever know what to do with. So yeah. why even deal with any kind of, you know, Fox or anything like that? He doesn't need to. He doesn't need to do anything other than make sure that Tracy's happy. And it's the same kind of thing that Megan was always wanting. You know, Megan would have loved to find a billionaire. Right. And, and, and Trevor, you know, found his, you know, golden ticket. And, you know, he, he doesn't need to worry about Fox and oh, I don't need to deal with that. I don't need to deal with that headache because I've already hit the jackpot. That is such a good call. Thanks for thanks for that. Reminding me of that because I knew he was married, but I didn't realize that that perhaps was the reason why he dropped that show. A hundred percent, because it was May 2018 that he pulled it back and they got engaged in June 2018. Oh my gosh. Genius. <laughs> All right. There is a male astrologer that says he personally met with Megan before her trip to London, the trip where she met Prince Harry. And he told her that she was going to marry a British prince or a British man, not a prince, but a British man, allegedly. I've heard you and several other people say that she was seeking a high profile Brit. What, do we know why British? What do you think her objective was? She just, I think that at the time when all this was happening it was after Trevor and her got divorced in 2013 that, you know, she's in Canada and stuff and she's <clears throat> seeing things like this. And, you know, there's a, there's more of a British media kind of thing. And, and, you know, she was probably reading the daily mail and reading about rich British people. And and she told a couple of people, she told Lizzie Cundy, she told Katie Hind <clears throat> that she was looking for somebody. I think that Ashley Cole had been hitting on her Oh yeah, and, <clears throat> and she had been hitting on Ashley. She always makes it sound like, it was Ashley who was going into her DMs, but she was going into his. Right. And, like she went and, into Pierce Morgan's. Yeah. And so she thought, you know, Ashley Cole, he's rich. He's, you know, good looking and stuff. He's he's a soccer player, Premier League. You know, let me be a wag. And yeah. I think that that's what she thought. And she also said that she was she really, really wanted to find a famous guy. And she even told Lizzie Cunney, she goes, you know, do you know any famous guys? I'm single and I really love Englishmen. And Lizzie said, we'll go find you some. And she said the same thing to, to Katie Hind. And when she met with Katie Hind, 
it was 2013 and Katie just kind of did it as a favor. She was, you know, working as a tabloid and, and she even admitted, look, I was working for a, a fourth rate tabloid. This is, you know, and so basically if, if Megan's coming to me, it shows that she's, you know, basically a fourth rate star and, and Katie had to be convinced like w with one of her friends to even take the meeting. Cause she really didn't want to, she didn't want to sit around and, and, and talk to Megan but Megan's just there and she's saying, you know, yeah, I want to meet somebody. And and she asks Katie about Ashley Cole. Should I date him and all this kind of stuff? And she's like, eh, you know, he's kind of cheating and, you know, he is a cheater and he cheated like a Cheryl Cole and stuff and everything. And, but yeah, I mean, Megan had this, she wanted to find somebody British. She wanted to find somebody famous. She wanted to find somebody rich and lo and behold, she lands Harry. Oh my gosh. I mean, some would say jackpot. Some would say not today. Some would be like, not so much. Do you have an opinion on whether or not she cheated on the, her chef boyfriend, Corey, while they were together in Canada? Do you do you no, have for sure? For sure. Yeah, that I, I kind of suspect the same. Um, you reported in in I believe it was April that Terry and Megan weren't necessarily in their Montecito home, the one that everybody talks about. But then again, in June. There was a really interesting story about Megan finding a temporary spot across from her talent agency in L.A. Do you have any updates on their current living arrangements? Because that seems to be debated quite a bit. OK, so let me give you the long version. Since I love it. The, the I long, love long versions. Version. <laughs> OK, so you live in L.A., but for those who do not, everybody says, oh, Montecito is really close. It's not close. Yeah. And um, and I, I see that and I'll see things like from the Daily Mail and go, oh, they don't want to drive the 40 minutes. OK, if you can make it to Montecito in 40 minutes, then I don't know what you're driving. But, yeah. you know, I would like that car yeah. um, or helicopter or whatever. I mean, you can barely helicopter in from Montecito in 40 minutes. Exactly. And so here's the thing is that, OK, well, you're in Montecito. It is a, a solid two hours from L.A. And mm -hmm. you think to yourself, Okay, I got to go take some meetings and stuff like that. So I need a place in LA to crash because I don't necessarily want to drive all the way back. Got it. So I understand like having a place in LA where you can overnight. What yeah. I didn't understand was why and Montecito you guys is extremely small. It's one it's one little tiny road that maybe is a half a mile. I mean that's the the downtown Montecito. It's filled with really nice hotels and it's really nice shops and really nice restaurants, but it is tiny. And Harry has a hotel room. I'm like, why does he need a hotel room in Montecito when <laughs> it will never take him longer than five minutes to get home? Right. And, and so the fact that he had one is like, okay, well, why does he need to get out of the house? What's going on that he needs to get out of the house? Right. So there's that. I understood, you know, that they have a place in LA or that they can crash, whatever. And then there's a, a brand new Fairmont that's across the street from, from Megan's, uh, from WME. And, so it's like, okay, she's got a place there so she can have meetings and stuff. And they're just spending more and more time apart. And there's nothing left for them to exploit together. Yeah. Okay. We had the Oprah interview, which they did together. Megan, you know, what was your, you know, relaxion, reaction, you know, introduction to the royal family, blah, blah, blah. Okay. That's something that was really important for her to discuss. I got it. But there's only so many times that you can tell that story. Yeah. Harry, he's got spare. OK, let's talk about this kind of stuff. And, you know, it was a bestseller and rightfully so, because people wanted to hear stuff about it and everything like that. But here's Megan still is like, I, I want to take advantage of where I am and I want to become more famous. I want to be a producer. I want to be a showrunner. I want to be in charge. I want people to, you know, to come to me. I want deals with Dior. I want all this kind of stuff. I want to, you know, compete with one of the paltrow. I want the TIG Mac. I, I want to be Oprah. Basically, right. well, let's just say that. No, that's just, so I, I've heard that. That's a genie. I mean, you're absolutely right when it comes to the Oprah. And she, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but was meeting with agents and managers in the UK right before she actually met Harry and was trying to sell them or, you know, get them to go out and sell her on a talk show, whether it be a cooking type show or a travel show. The, I, your Oprah is the greatest comparison you could make. I do believe that that was her aspiration. Yeah, because an Oprah controls careers, right? Yeah. Whether it's Dr. Phil or, you know, whoever. Oprah makes people. Oprah sells authors. Oprah, you know, when she had her talk show, she made her broke people. You know, I mean, you would become the biggest star in the world, Dr. Oz, whatever. Or they all owe themselves to Oprah. Yeah. And I think that Megan wanted to be the same kind of player and just 
And the thing is, Harry <clears throat> is not, okay? Yeah. We have to understand that despite the fact that Harry has a career as a, as a veteran and, and did noble service in Afghanistan and all this kind of stuff, the dude <laughs> is not a worker. Right. I think he just wants to sit around and smoke pot all day yeah. and and do this. And one of my friends, um, good friends, Bill Simmons, who runs The Ringer, which is a sports website, but as part of the deal, he sold it to Spotify. And in addition to you know running The Ringer, he has executive responsibilities with Spotify. And so he's in charge of, I don't know, development and stuff like this. And so they said, hey, Bill, could you talk to Harry? Because he's really not doing anything. Yeah. And, and so Bill, you know, has this zoom call with, with Harry and some stuff Bill told me in private and some stuff he's told public. And I was trying to remember which part was public and which was private. <laughs> but for the, for the most part, it was like, he offered a bunch of suggestions and Harry was just like, no, no, I really, I want to see myself. I want to interview like Putin and I want to interview like Trump and all these kind of things I want. And okay. But what is your perspective? What, what are you going to ask them? Like, what is your angle? And one of the things that I've said that I think that Harry would succeed at if he was doing a podcast is what he should have done as, as his, you know, history as a veteran is that he should have got people like British veterans and American veterans and, and had conversations with them and talked about things like that. And, you know, especially with Invictus, okay, you were injured and stuff, you know, how are people treating you and things like that. There was just so many things that you could bring to the table that he had as this perspective, but he wasn't interested in doing anything. Right. He just doesn't want to do anything. And I think Megan, for whatever, we have to realize that there is a drive there. Yeah. The, the drive to become famous, the drive, hey, I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity that I was given and I am going to run with it and I'm going to try and be the biggest star in the whole world. Yeah. And 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 Harry's just like, eh, I'd rather sit at home and do nothing. And I, I just don't think that that's what Megan wants to do, which is going back to what I originally said, where William Morris is representing Megan and they're not, you know, representing Harry and, and Harry's going to do this Africa documentary and it's going to go off to Africa. And he's supposedly looking for some places to stay like for several months while he's there. Yeah. And so this is, these are two people that are now living separate lives. How long can that continue? I mean, you explain that so eloquently. I mean, uh, ambitious as hell is how I would d define Meghan Markle. And that's not always a bad thing. Um, and I think to, I think about the night in New York where Meghan was accepting that award from one of her idols and the night ending in the over over exaggerated, near catastrophic car chase. I just think how disappointed was Megan likely in that scenario? This was supposed to be her night. She was dressed to the nines. She looked like a physical trophy in that gold dress. She was accepting an award from somebody that she really admires, has admired, you know, according to her since she was a child. And it all blew up in their faces when they released that press release the next morning. And I'm, I feel certain that it was Harry driven, basically comparing the evening to the his mother's death, um, and then turning the entire conversation around, not about what a great podcaster, content creator, and feminist that Meghan Markle is, that she's accepting this award from a feminist icon, but again to, and I'm sorry to use the word, but the paranoia that kind of haunts Harry about his mother. So, you know, you describing how she wants to be out there, wants, to, wants her brand to grow, wants to be the center of attention. There, there's a real hindrance there from Harry. Yeah. And think going back to that award and it's Gloria Steinem um, yeah. and presented the award. Here's the thing about awards is that this was a charity function and the charity was not selling any tickets at all. So what do you do when you want these people who are always asked to give money and can you buy a table? Can you do this? You know, it's not the Met Gala. Right. So we need you to buy a table. Um, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give award to Meghan Markle. So we're going to give this award. And so as soon as they said that they're going to give the award to Meghan Markle, then all of a sudden all the tables sell out. Right. So it is all about, it's not so much Meghan, you know, earn this award. It's just that, hey, we can sell a lot of tickets if we give it to Meghan. Yeah, and, exactly. They'll get butts in seats. They'll get a crazy amount of free PR. Right. And here's the thing. It's like, okay, the way it works is if they had stayed in this hotel, um, and they wanted a room for free. 
And the hotel's like, no, we're not going to give you a room for free. Exactly. And it's $10,000. And here's the thing. They can afford $10,000. They can charge a $10,000 room. No problem. And the thing is, is they didn't want to. And what would have happened is if they had the, if they had got the room at the hotel, here's what would have happened. First of all, they would have gone from their room out to the, the lobby, walked 10 feet from the lobby to the suburban And there would have been pictures taken. They get in the Suburban. They drive over to the place where the award is. They get out this 10 feet, get the pictures taken, just like when you saw them leaving. And at the end of the night, they leave, they get pictures taken. They drive back to the hotel. They get pictures taken for 10 minutes in the lobby. But because of the fact that they didn't want to actually spend money, they were staying at a friend's house. Right. And for free. And because they were doing that, they did not necessarily want to know have everybody know where the the friends were. So they they drive and the next thing you know, they're being followed by the paparazzi who would not have followed them if they were going to the hotel because and to, they would have just you, been waiting at the hotel. And I've my friends that work over there, I have one specific that works. He's a New York street photographer. He told me everybody knew where they were staying. So the, it, you know, the, the, we're trying to keep the paparazzi from our friend's house was kind of an irrelevant argument because everybody knew they were staying there and that, I think it was it the Carlisle. I think, you know, yeah, it was the Carlisle, which Princess Diana, and they wanted to say yes, the Princess that's what Diana I was suite. Say. Exactly. That Princess <laughs> Diana loved that hotel. So again, it's just, it's just another, the entitlement is crazy because Diana would have never expected to stay at the Carlisle for free. Um, I, I, you reported in March that m- this is, re- this just fires me up. You reported in March, Megan won't come out and directly say it. She lets her staff handle it. They get to tell people visiting that Megan prefers them to curtsy when meeting her and also prefers they call her by her royal title. No using her birth name. Then in May, you say the first meeting at the super agency, which now I think is William Morris Endeavor. When is expected, the staff were told to call Megan by her title. No one was allowed to use her first name. This drives royal watchers crazy. Um, it's their insistence on using their titles, hijacking the queen's private nickname for their daughter, all while defaming the British royal family. Um, do the Sussexes not see the hypocrisy in their actions with this title insistence, this title demand? Well, here's the thing. Are they the ones who wanted to not be in the monarchy, right? They're the ones yeah. who wanted to, to go to Canada. They're the ones who wanted this quiet life. And honestly, here's the deal. If they had stayed on Vancouver Island and just stayed there and stayed hidden and all this kind of stuff, I would have said, great, you know, fantastic. You were doing exactly what you said you were going to do. You're just, you know, you're just living your life. You're living your life quiet and in solitude. And I would have said, congratulations. I don't know if you should have been staying in a Russian oligarch's house, but other than that, I'm okay with, with you doing that. But the thing is that they didn't, they changed and don't forget they trademarked the whole Sussex thing and all of this kind of stuff. Yeah, so yeah. You, you had all that going on and then to say, we don't want titles, but then don't forget. And I, I've talked about this, is that, you know, they wanted the, the titles for the children. And, yeah. and the other thing is there is, um, you know, an Anglican church, like in Montecito or whatever. And, they could have gone there to have the baptism, but no, they went to, to LA to do it so they could have the bishop and everything. And, and they just made a really huge deal out of it. And it's just always like, oh, we want to use the title. And when they go to William Morris Endeavor and it's like, welcome the Duchess of Sussex or whatever. Okay. But I thought they didn't want to use the titles. Right. And, and yes, the whole curtsy thing. And, and Megan loves that kind of stuff, you know? <laughs> and, and I, and I, I think I talked about it with Dumois or whatever, but I've, and because it was this personal experience where, um, there was a senator and he got married for like the third or fourth time or something like that. And, you know, and I knew this wife and she was just, she had her own name, but she would refuse to call herself by her first name. She would always call herself Mrs. The last name of the senator. So this senator's wife, instead of using her first name or whatever, or whatever she was calling, she would say, hi, this is Mrs. Blank. And just the last name of the senator. Yeah. So just to let you know, right off the fact, right off the bat, that I'm, I mean, that this is who I'm, I am, and who you know. So you need to say yes to me. And it's the same thing with 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 Megan and saying, you know, I'm the Duchess of Sussex or whatever. I'm not Megan Markle anymore. Don't use my, you know, birth name anymore. I am the Duchess and stuff like that. And the thing is, like William Morris Endeavor, they're like, oh, of course, we'll just call you that, and everybody, and you know, do this. And she would not be getting this attention if she was Megan Markle from Suits, right? 
Absolutely. And I think that they're savvy enough to understand that. So they go along with it. They go along with that branding. Um, we've kind of talked about how she wants to dominate just in general, uh, be, be as famous as she can possibly be and take advantage of this opportunity. You know, when we talk about that, I do kind of wonder how realistic the idea of her going into politics is, because it does seem like she is... It, excited about the the fame opportunity but for years you have been discussing po megan's political aspiration on the blog um, for instance reporting that megan has at least one domain registered to make it seem like she'd like to run for president which you later updated to say that you found more than one domain registered associated with a potential presidential run or political run political what run are, not presidential oh p political run what are your thoughts on megan's political pursuits a realistic option for her or no I think that it was. I think yeah. that at some point she changed. Um, I think that she was really kind of contemplating and she did have um, lunch uh, several times with Gavin Newsom, the governor mm -hmm. of California. And it was basically about Dianne Feinstein's seat, who yeah. everybody expects is going to resign before um, next year when her when she's up for reelection. So if if she did resign, then Gavin Newsom would appoint somebody as an interim senator until the next election. And I think that at one point, Megan, I don't know, thought about the idea of trying to to do that. I think that it's much less, and now especially, I think it's the the odds of it are infinitesimal just because of the deal that she signed with William Morris and stuff. Yeah. I think that that's something that she's not interested in anymore. I think that she's just full in on, let me be this, you know, show business mogul kind of thing. And yeah. you see it in her hirings. Um, Archwell, despite the fact that, you know, they were talking originally about, oh, let's do documentaries about the underprivileged and all this kind of stuff. Everybody that Megan hires or Archwell hires are scripted people. Yeah. They're hiring scripted development people. And the things that they're pitching to Netflix are scripted shows. They're not pitching, you know, documentaries. They're not pitching anything altruistic. They're they're just pitching straight up, hey, let me do we're pitching Emily in Paris, but with a guy. Oh, we're pitching, yeah. <clears throat> we're pitching um, a Great Expectations kind of version with Miss Havisham, and she's like, um, you know, a feminist and stuff like that. But people had already um, pitched that before, and the Emily in Paris thing. I get the idea. Let's because Emily in Paris is popular and it's right. on Netflix. But here's the thing: if you're Netflix, are you going to go to the showrunner for Emily in Paris? who has already given you a hit and right. say, what do you got? And they go, well, you know, let's do a reverse kind of thing. Let's, let's do, you know, with a guy or something like that, or let's not do that. Cause I don't want to tick off the showrunner for, or for Emily in Paris, cause they're going to give us something else. So it's lazy kind of pitching. Um, you know, the Miss Havisham thing has been pitched a bunch of times. BBC kind of pitched a certain angle like that. The Emily in Paris, oh, but with a guy, you're not going to take a chance. If you're Netflix, you're not going to take a chance on somebody that's unproven, even if they're Meghan Markle. Um, and they prove that with Pearl. And they're right. like, because they're like, okay, Pearl's fine. However, we were going to do it just because you are Meghan Markle. And everybody's like, but no kids who are going to watch Pearl even know who Meghan Markle is. So we just need a good show. We need a good idea. And so she's out there like pitching stuff and she wasn't getting anywhere. So, but when you get with William Morris, then Ari Emanuel is like, look, Netflix, give her this deal and then I'll give you whoever three or four A-listers or whatever, who will be willing to be in the show. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, cause you, the whole thing is about packaging. And one of the other agents is the one who does works with the rock, but in the sense that they do all of the making rock bigger than life, not necessarily rock. Let me give you the acting deal, but rock let's, every kind of promotion we can do and everything like that, where we can put him front and center. That's the agent that they put with it. And then they have Serena Williams agent and just for endorsements and stuff like that. And I think that's going to be tied more into like the TIG, which she has, you know, reinstated and, and just everything that they can. And William and Boris and Deborah like leaked the whole Dior thing, even though that's probably never going to happen, but they wanted, you know, Megan to feel powerful and special and say, look, Dior's thinking about you to be one of the faces of their brands and stuff like that. And not only that, but they I think they were trying to distract from all of the humiliation associated with the South Park episode. Yeah. And but the South Park episode is it's so on point. It's like, <laughs> yeah, you know, and 
and the fact that they wanted to sue and stuff. And also with Harry, you've seen him go to England a couple of times when he really didn't need to. And yeah. I do think that Harry is affected more so than people think about his mom. And yeah. I think that sometimes we think, okay, well, he uses the same cream as his mom, which is kind of weird. Yeah. And he doesn't have this fascination with his mom and the whole, oh, you know, the paparazzi were chasing us. And he did lose his mom at a young age. Right. So let's, let's not, you know, and he has been in therapy and, you know, and that's, I think one of the reasons he signed up for better up, which is a horrible app and a horrible company. But I think one of the reasons he did was he had, you know, gone undergone therapy and stuff and probably did it in, you know, his, his role as a veteran and stuff. And I do think that he has been affected yeah. by what happened with his mom, but I think he maybe Megan kind of played him a little bit. And don't forget that Megan has been, Megan's an actress. Yes. And, and even though you can, you know, belittle, you know, suits, it was still a show and she was still one of the leads. And, right. you know, they're not going to hire somebody for that who really can't act because the other people on the show can act and she can act too. And just, you know, I'm going to bring him in. I got him, you know, and all of this. And then, well, Harry, why don't we do this? Why don't we go on Oprah? Why don't we... And just kind of playing around with that. And I think at Harry, at some point here, it's like, I wouldn't mind going back to England or, or I wouldn't mind going to do what I had said I was going to do before and go to Africa and not be involved in all this kind of stuff. And you right. could tell that Harry was caught up in all of this stuff when there was the Lion King premiere in London and he, he corners Bob Iger, the, the CEO of Disney and says, you yeah. know, you really should find something for, for Megan or whatever. Yeah. And it's just like, you could tell right then that he was just so enamored with the whole lifestyle of Hollywood and, oh my gosh, and I'm, I'm, I'm dating somebody who I've seen on TV. Yeah. And it's a totally, he, he's not unlike so many other people are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm with this person. And I think he just got kind of caught up in it all. And, you know, they've got the kids now. And I do one of one of the things that I really wonder about, and I've never been able to come up with an answer, is the whole Lilibet thing. I don't know whose idea it was. Oh, my gosh. And, and I kind of, I, I want to say that it's Megan's idea. Right. And because, oh, let's call her Lilibet. Because this was something that was very, very um opposed Favorite? by the the royal family i mean it was right. one of those kind of things where you know oh a royal family source or whatever and you go okay but this one was real and the bbc went with it the bbc didn't retract anything right and i mean it's, the bbc is not you know the daily mail it's the bbc it's a government-run corporation right and the fact that you know they took this nickname because it's one thing to call your daughter elizabeth and it's an honor, right? You're you're yeah. honoring your grandmother, um, or in this case, the the great grandmother, because it's a little bit. And you're like, okay, this that seems like a really good idea. Let's call her Elizabeth, and not knowing that she, they're going to call her Lilibet, and just this private nickname, right? And and Harry, let's say it was Megan's idea, but Harry went along with it, and he must have known that that was going to be just a horrible idea, right? But he didn't have enough spine to to do anything and i honestly think that that was that whole rigmarole and i just i i really think that over the last year we have seen that these are two totally different people with two totally different agendas and can they keep it together and i i would argue that if megan gets some kind of huge deal like just something that's worth 20 30 40 million guaranteed then harry's out the door wow I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I, I can't disagree with you. If she feels like she is, you know, a, a power on her own, a powerhouse on her own. Um, I think you're right. Did, it was, did you post recently that she was with a billionaire somehow associated with associated with Angelina Jolie? Was that you yeah. that I saw? Okay. Yeah. 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 So what's so funny about that is that an astrologer that I sometimes feature on the podcast posted on her Instagram feed. Next up, Megs will be looking for a billionaire after Harry. Her name is Emily. And then somebody responded to her and she included this in her Instagram stories. NT Lawyer just posted she was hanging out with a billionaire that Angelina Jolie was hanging with. 
And so you are, we think that billionaire is on the horizon. That's the ultimate objective. Well, I think that she looks at her ex and says, oh, well, he landed a billionaire. And I'm not saying that Megan's trying to land this guy in order to have a relationship with him. Right, right. But, it, think, but you are who you But he's a financing guy. Right. Yeah. But he's a finance guy. And, you know, that's why Angelina Jolie was there was like, oh, he's you know, Angelina wants to date him. No, Angelina wanted some financing for something for a movie. Yeah. And, oh, you know, okay. the easiest way to do that is with a billionaire. And she had hung out like Megan was hanging out with a Getty. <clears throat> To try and get some money. And the thing is, this goes back to, you know, she has lunch with Gavin Newsom and Gavin Newsom owes his political fortune to the Getty family. Yeah. And and whether it's Balthazar or Balthazar's parents or whatever, it's the Getty family that supported Gavin Newsom and gave him money financially were his first political donors when he and when he was mayor of San Francisco and after when he was wanted to expand his profile, it was the Getty family that did it. And so you have this one Getty, the this elderly guy who's basically insane. And Megan's trying to see, well, can I get money from him? And, and, but the thing is his money is so locked up that she's not really going to be able to get anything, but people are like, oh, she wants to marry him. She's not going to marry some 80 year old guy. That's not yeah, Megan. Just, this is not um, what Anna Nicole Smith, the Anna it's Nicole not, Smith no. story, yeah, but we not, appreciate it. Yeah. So it's not like that. And that's the thing. It also, it's just, people just get distracted by that kind of thing. But the other guy, this Rothschild guy, he's young, he's fairly attractive or whatever. And he's a billionaire. And but at least, you know, he, and he's he's had associations with with other actresses in the sense that, yeah, you know, if you pitch something and it's a decent idea. And so if Megan wants some kind of financing and, and there you go. And if something happens, you know, after she and Harry divorced, then, yeah, OK, then I'm with a billionaire. But I don't think at this point that she was like, I'm going to marry a billionaire and be quiet. It's not like with Trevor, who's married his billionaire and he doesn't really care about any kind of work and anything like that. Yeah, I think that at right now she's just focused on being the biggest power that she can be. And I think that if she was married to a billionaire, that she would lose her edge a little bit. Yes. Harry doesn't have a lot of money and they have a mortgage and, you know, and security is so ex their security is insane, you know, price wise. Yes. You know, and OK. Because you There's go back to his mom, you know, you think like exactly what you said. Harry's being, Harry is so protective of, of Megan because of his mother. He is. And but here's the thing that a lot of people don't realize is that, yes, their security bill is high. But it, the thing is, they don't pay for all of the security, whether you want to believe it or not. The United States actually pays for some security for them, just like in Canada, Canada wow. pays for security when they're vacant. Because here's why. OK, let's say the. I'm going to pick a really small country, um, the prime minister of Grenada, which is an island off the in the Caribbean, off the coast of South America. So the prime minister of Grenada comes to the United States as soon. And this is a country that doesn't have their own like airline or anything like that. He flies commercial, comes in, um, flies coach, maybe first class, comes in. As soon as he lands, there are going to be five or six Secret Service people meeting the prime minister. Why? Right. Because we don't want somebody assassinated in our country who is a prime minister of a country. We okay. do not want somebody who's assassinated, who is technically, you know, still in the line of succession in the throne. If there's some bad accident and William and his kids go, then there's Harry. So right. we're not going to let anything happen to him. We're not going to let him be kidnapped. We're not going to. Now, how much control Secret Service has? Maybe not a lot, but they're there. There's at least somebody and there's at least some kind of point person who's dealing with the security and everything like that. Same as when Harry goes back to England. Metropolitan police were going to always give him security. He just wanted extra security that he was willing to pay for. Right. And again, I think to make the point, he was just kind of wanted attention. Look, we're getting this kind of protection, but I really want extra protection. And yeah. everyone's like, like, well, wait a second. William doesn't even have much protection. And he, you know, you can argue that he is much more important than you in the whole scheme of things. Right. So, Which he hates that argument, by the way. Harry does not like that argument. Exactly. So, you know, but yes, the and when he was there in Canada, then Canadian protection was there too. And Canada, you know, foot the bill. And is there like a huge Secret Service presence? No. But there is, you know, the United States is not going to let anything happen to Harry. You know, there is somebody supervising that security or working with, coordinating with the Secret Service of the United States and his security firm. I really, you've said a couple of times about, you know, you talked about Megan meeting with Gavin. Do you believe that that in any way, shape or form disrupted 
um, the California Democrats. That uh, is that why the Bidens have distanced themselves because they feel like Megan is sticking her nose in where it doesn't belong when she's having these meetings with Gavin, when she's calling up, you know, when she's calling up representatives, trying to talk to them directly about um, extended home leave. Are are these things ruffling feathers in the White House? Do you believe those rumors? I don't know if it's ruffling things, but when you're calling, you know, Congress people or assembly in California and you're calling as the Duchess of Sussex yeah. rather than Meghan Markle, it's really not a it's not a good look. I think yeah. that Gavin Newsom was prepared and ready that if Biden decided that he wasn't going to run or was unable to run, that Gavin Newsom was going to throw his hat in the ring. And I still think that he's ready at a moment's notice to do so. Yes. And I think that as part of that. You know, he had spoken with Megan. Maybe she had been interested, like I said, in a senatorial appointment if Diane Feinstein went out. But other than that, like he's just saying, OK, well, it, it will help to have Meghan Markle in my corner and she can raise funds and all of this kind of stuff. Should I decide to run for president? Right. And I think that the fact that everybody kind of knows that Gavin Newsom's waiting if Biden slips up or can't run or whatever and that's probably ticks off the White House because of the fact that, hey, yeah. no, it's Biden. I'm running. I'm running. Gavin Newsom, you got to stay quiet. You're, you're not doing this. But meanwhile, like Gavin Newsom runs ads on Twitter every single day, um, you know, saying you're talking about gun control and stuff. But it's his way of being front and center just in case. And just in case I'm going to have all these people ready so they can, you know, throw me fundraisers and stuff like that. And just think about, you know, Megan getting Oprah and all these kind of people and organizing a twenty five thousand dollar plate dinner. Yeah. Um, oh, you know, my gosh. It's, yeah, it's I can visualize it now. Absolutely. You're, oh, my gosh. That Chris Jenner, Ellen sitting next to each other with, you know, oh, my gosh. Absolutely. Um, in January, uh, well, Chris Jenner wouldn't vote for Kevin Newsom. Oh, you don't think so? No. Oh, my gosh. That's oh, that's good intel. Um, <laughs> in January of 2022, you wrote it was never about the charity or foundation, which has never had a clear goal. So we're, that's, a you know, over a year ago regarding R12. Has there been any evolution? Do you have a better understanding of what their mission is today? They have no mission. Thank you. OK, <laughs> they, they they have zero mission. You know, the whole Archwell thing came because they lost the Sussex brand, yeah. right? They weren't allowed to use that. So then they said, okay, well, we got to come up with something. So they come up with Archwell, which is a ridiculous name. Yes. And um, yeah, but it was designed to be a charity, but they're they're not working on any kind of charitable efforts or anything like that. I think at some point, you know, I think if you go back to say 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic and Harry and Meghan going to deliver groceries or whatever it was to somebody's house. And then they do had you to remember, go back and do it again. Do you remember the how they wasn't working? Ex oh my gosh. Thank you. I was just going to say, I remember sitting here watching like channel five or whatever the NBC station is here and seeing the, the ring door video and the security video of them delivering groceries and delivering meals. And NT, I was like, they had to get that from somebody like who handed that over to the news station. There's no way the news station would air that without permission. Yeah. So what happened back then? OK, well, first of all, the because of the pandemic, the the the, the charity was like, we're only having our employees deliver stuff um, because we don't want anybody to, to be sick. So we're not allowing volunteers or whatever. It's our employees are delivering it or we've made arrangements or we're hiring people to do it. We don't really want to have any volunteers. Right. So, but Megan and Harry said, no, no, please let us leave. Okay, fine. You guys can go deliver, you know, two bags of food. And they went and delivered two bags of food, but the person where they were delivering it, their ring camera or whatever was not working. So then they had to find somebody else to go do it. And, you know, so then they did it and you see the, the ring camera footage and stuff like that. And obviously they knew what was up and it's just the same. Megan's not stupid people. And <laughs> And the thing is, is like when you see photos of her, like a couple of months ago, it was right after Spare came out and stuff and she was not getting attention. And so, you know, it was not just the full court blitz, like with us weekly and people magazine, oh, Megan's favorite mascara, this kind of stuff, because yeah. she was jealous that Harry was getting all the attention. But then, OK, Harry's over in, in London at this whatever trial and I want some attention. So I'm going to call up paparazzi and I'm going to be here with my two friends and my I'm going to take a hike. I'm going to take a hike. Now, the two friends, you could tell they didn't know what's up. They were dressed for a hike. They were dressed like shorts and a T-shirt or whatever. And she's all dressed to the nines. Yeah. And if you think for one second 
that a paparazzi is going to get within 15 feet of Meghan Markle and take a photo just full on and not have a security guard there, you are just full of it. Right. And it's the same thing if you want to compare it to a celebrity. Look at Taylor Swift. If you get a shot of Taylor Swift 10 feet on, full on in front, it's because she let them. Right. It's not. It's because she arranged it. And here's the thing. Is a Meghan Markle photo worth something? Yeah, it's probably worth five grand. Maybe a touch more. Right. But if, you, if you're if you a paparazzi, first of all, you're not in Montecito because you're not really making any money in Montecito. You're in LA, so you got to make the hike up there. Yeah. And that's fine. But somebody's got to call you for it. You're not staking out Montecito in the hope that once every two or three weeks, you get a $5,000 photo. Exactly. That's so true. <laughs> That's not how it works. Right. Um, you're so right. Do you think that the Sussexes have enough support to function comfortably? Or do you, they have to change gears to win over some of their haters? Oh, I think that, you know, Megan's got enough supporters or whatever. I just... But the problem is, is that let's say the Emily in Paris thing was, you know, greenlit and yeah. you get a green light or whatever. What it would, if it's still a bad show, nobody's going to watch it if it's a bad show. Right. And, and so once you go into that kind of mode, who you are and, you know, whether you're getting feminist awards or whatever, it doesn't matter if you're team Megan, it's like, okay, great. I'm team Megan. The show still sucks. I'm not going to watch it. And that was what Netflix said with Pearl. They said, it's great, fine, whatever. It's not a bad show, but the reason we had you here is like we're, we thought that if it's a show and we said, you know, from the Duchess of Sussex or whatever, and they realized the kids don't care because kids don't have any idea who she is. And that was their stated reason for not greenlining the show is that the kids didn't know who Meghan Markle was, so there's no cachet in it at all. Right. And, and she doesn't have like a mommy brand. Like if she were, if she, if she was really pursuing the mommy brand industry with the TIG, turning the TIG into here's my favorite DIY lunch snack for Lily and Archie, it would be one thing, but that mommy brand doesn't exist yet. If it ever will, I don't know. I think that she doesn't want it to exist. I think that she wants to be glamorous. showrunner, glamorous, Dior yeah. kind of thing. She wants that. She wants, you know, to people to go, Oh my God, look at this. And I think she wants the you know, the 10 page spread in Vogue and, you know, just the seat of honor at the Met Gala and all this kind of stuff and be on the board for that and get to decide what the thing is and, you know, have lunches with Anna Wintour and all this kind of stuff. And you're not, it, mommy brand is, okay, that didn't work. Let's try the TIG. Let's go against Gwyneth Paltrow. Let's do this. And she has, she has been competing against Gwyneth Paltrow behind the scenes. I forget the name of it. There's some product that's that's really hard to find. And it's like the the new kind of, oh, you got to have this kind of like, think about like a turmeric when everybody was like so into turmeric or something. Yeah, yeah. But it's like this ingredient that's really hard to get. And she basically got some people and they have like the monopoly on the product. So if she ever does decide to to relaunch the TIG and goes, oh, this kind of thing. But I'm not sure that she wants to be the snake oil person unless she has to be the snake oil person. Right, last think, resort. That's a last resort. The mommy thing, that's a last resort. Um, you know, to me, that's the Chrissy Teigen route, who was also on Dealer No Deal. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's that kind of thing where you're trying to come up with an identity outside of John Legend. So Chrissy Teigen does this and says, okay, and, and Megan's coming, okay, I need to break away from Harry, but Harry's not, you know, John Legend. He's not out there singing songs. He's not out there performing in yeah, front of 50,000 yeah. people and stuff. So I think Megan has an idea of what she's doing. And I think that with the guidance of William Morris and stuff, she's going to have some projects, but I don't think it's going to be, I don't think people are going to watch it just because it's a Duchess of Sussex production, because it's not going to be a Meghan Markle production. It's going to be Duchess of Sussex. So executive producer, Duchess of Sussex. Great. So if she had, let's say pitched Wednesday, which is on Netflix and you know, it's a good show. So everybody's watching Wednesday, but are they going to care? Are they watching it because it was a Duchess of Sussex show or are they just watching it because it's a good show? Right. Absolutely. Uh, do, do I have time for two more questions or do you, I understand if I have to let you go? No, go ahead. Oh, thank you so much. Um, you know, you made such an interesting comment on Demois' podcast recently about Omid's claim not to have Harry's direct contact information. And you were very savvy in explaining that as an attorney, you read, you know, between the lines. Um, you know, I don't think any of us ever thought that 
Prince Harry was Omid Scobie's point of contact. Can you kind of go into that a little bit and, and what Omid said and what your interpretation of it was and why? Yeah. So Omid gets his information, right? He's getting it from, let's say, Harry or Meghan. Let's say we pretend we don't know. Right. <laughs> and even though we know it's Megan. So somebody asks him and he goes, I don't even have Harry's phone number. I don't have his email address. Great. So everybody goes, OK, he's not the source. But what is the omission there? What isn't being said? The person, the question was not asked, oh, do you have Megan's? He didn't offer that up. Right. He just said, I don't have Harry's. Great. Because he doesn't have Harry's. He has Megan's. He has yeah. Megan's email. He has Megan's phone number. That's his contact. And he just said, I don't have Aries. Why would you guys even think that? Right. But again, but the other half of the equation, he didn't even mention Megan. If he didn't have Harry and Megan's, you go, I don't even have the contact information for Harry and Megan. I, I can't even get a hold of him if I want to. Right. Okay. That would have clarified. He didn't say that. He only mentioned Harry. And this is the kind of thing where all kinds of, as a lawyer and also dealing with gossip, you look at what is being said and what is not being said. You look at an argument that should be made or all-inclusive argument, and you go, okay. And there's always a lot of omissions when it comes to, you know, Megan and stuff. And and you have to look at, at the things. You have to look at, what, like I said earlier, when she hired people for Archwell, you go, okay, well, she hired this woman. And the job title is, oh, oh, in charge of development of scripted production. And you're like, okay, <laughs> We know that you're going to be pitching TV shows. Right. So that's what you're doing. You are pitching TV shows. You are no different than Trevor Ingleson, other than the fact that you have a bigger name than your ex ever did. You right. are no different than Ryan Murphy pitching a show. You are no different than Shonda Rhimes pitching a show. They all have scripted development people. That's what they're doing. And they're just going to pitch and pitch and pitch. And do I think that she's going to land some shows? Absolutely. Because Ari Emanuel over at William Morris is going to say, like I said, he's going to package a whole bunch of people and he's going to say, look, we'll give you this person and this person. Netflix is going to go, great, you know, green light. Right. And they're going to do it. And it's going to decide whether the, the show sucks or not. But it's not going to have anything to do with who Meghan Markle is. The Meghan Markle brand, and I know she knows this, is that she can be a Ryan Murphy or a Shonda Rhimes. But the way that you're going to make a name for yourself is if something like the Dior where you're the face of something, where you're the face of some exclusive kind of brand, where you look at it, like the face of Versace or, you know, becoming best friends with um, Arnaud, you know, and, and, and being in Gucci and all this kind of stuff, or have your own kind of company like Rihanna got with Fenty. Just, it's going to have to be something like that, where Megan's just in your face all of the time. A showrunner is great. And if she wants a career as a showrunner, more power to her because that's a tough career and it's a, you know, if she does that and succeeds at it and has successful shows, I'm going to say congratulations. I know how hard that is. And you did it. Right. Um, but I don't think that's where she's going to go. I think that she wants the whole look at me, look at me, look at me, look at this exclusive kind of brand that I am. And, you know, I want to have my own design house and all of this kind of that's what she wants. And I think if she gets that, then great if she has Harry on her arm from time to time, but I think that she's going to be bored with that. And I think, like I said, if she gets some kind of deal where she's guaranteed 30, 40 million bucks, Harry's out the door. So you do believe that it would be Megan that would end the relationship? 100%. I, I agree with you. I did have somebody email me recently asking me why specifically did Harry and Megan get the Shonda Rhimes treatment when it came to Netflix? Um, but, it, you know, is it because they thought that Harry was going to be working with wounded warriors and doing this therapy thing that he's become kind of synonymous with the mental health thing where he could you get a glimpse of who Harry is through him talking to these people or I mean, I even thought, why didn't he do a series, even a podcast or a book about famous spares? You know, he could talk about his grandfather and how he's the most famous spare or Princess Margaret, who is a notoriously fun spare, um, you know, like there were so much opportunity opportunity to keep that royal connection. Did they get the Shonda Rhimes deal because Netflix was Netflix was under the impression that there would be that royal connection consistently? Or do they have faith in them that they will hire people that are smarter and more creative and can really develop, um, you know, some interesting content that is maybe unrelated to royalty? I think that Netflix had a whole bunch of money in the pandemic because everybody was staying home. 
right? <laughs> and was throwing money left and right. And they don't have that kind of money anymore. Spotify yeah. the same. And Spotify gave them all the chances in the world. But when you give 12 episodes of a show and you have 10 producers. Oh my gosh, show, so embarrassing. Yeah. You no, know, I mean, I do an episode every single day of my podcast. I don't have producers or anything like that. Yeah. And the fact that they had 10 producers and can still only come up with 12 in however many years shows that they really weren't that interested in the Spotify portion. They weren't interested in the podcasting. And we already know that Harry didn't really want to do that kind of work. Megan, I think, was just doing it because she, you know, okay, well, I'll give it a shot or whatever. But she doesn't want to do podcasting. She doesn't want to sit behind a microphone. That's not what she wants to do. But that NT, is not like, the Megan brand. I, I, I totally get it, NT, but at the same time, I think what a missed opportunity. Because if they did utilize both of these platforms correctly, they could have taken away the power from people like me, from people like the British press, who are, because my next question to you was going to be, are they throwing too many darts at the wall? Or are we are, are a lot of these outlets that we're talking about not even realistic you know i mean like that headline about megan being in the bodyguard there's no way that anybody's talking to her about the bodyguard in my opinion but i, I just i just feel like had had they had megan been less scripted less produced more genuine and sincere in in her podcasting in the content of her podcasts had they you know, really leaned more into the reality and, and less produced in the documentary, they could Kate, they could really take control of the narrative and and take control of the the way that the British media talk about them incessantly. And I mean, on a daily basis, I'm asked about them, about things that I don't think are true. This idea I mean, every I mean, I, I'm now I'm getting to the point where I'm saying I just don't think that's true and I don't want to comment on it. But it feels like if they were more genuine and more open on these platforms that were handing them an ungodly amount of money, they could shut down a lot of the chatter about them and shut down a lot of the people that are making, I don't make this kind of money, but I know that the outlets that I talk to are making a ton of money on my commentary on them. And I wouldn't be in a position to commentate on them as often as I am if they were more genuine and sincere and created the content that I think was expected of them. I, I no, I don't think so at all because I don't think that they would do that. Yeah. And I also think that you know, going back to the Shonda deal, they didn't really get a Shonda deal. Yeah. They got okay, you know, let's let's see what you come up with. And they had the whole, you know, Harry and Meghan documentary, and Netflix was oh, that's a good start. Let's let's do something else. Well, what do we have? We don't have anything else because we've already said all the stuff that we had to say about the royal family and everything like Oprah. that. So we really don't have any more of that. Yeah. And so, but going to to what you said, I mean, think about like Meghan had Andy Cohen. On, on her podcast and it's just like okay i thought you wanted to be like you know this you know high end kind of look down at this kind of doc you know documentary kind of thing and let's what we can do to to pull people up and you have andy cohen from real housewives and watch what happens live and that's who you're going to have on and harry where did you go oh, i went on Dak shepherd's podcast <laughs> and you know it's just like okay um and <laughs> you know and i did something with james gordon and okay but they're not going to do any commentary on it. You know, I, I think that Harry, with, especially with this last trial, with the whole, you know, whether or not his phone was hacked and stuff like that. And here's the thing is that my whole point with that whole trial was he assumes that they were hacking his phone because that's the only way they could have found out certain information. That's not true yeah. because he he was talking to other people and other people can sell stories, too. Right. And that's so that is so like, oh, my gosh, the only way they could ever find anything about me is if they hacked my phone. No. You know, the reason I find out about Harry and Meghan stuff is because Meghan talks and other people talk. Right. And that's right. the reason nobody's hacking Meghan's phone. Nobody's hacking Harry's phone right now. It's just that they have friends and they talk and there's a agency involved and the people at the agency talk and Jessica Mulroney talk. Everybody talks. Right. And Harry just is under the impression that, oh, my gosh, nobody would ever say it's, it has to be because my phone was hacked. No, it's not. And that's very egocentric of you to think that and yeah. to think that, that nobody is just like selling something for a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks to a tabloid about you. And, you know, it's just no.
Well, that's yeah. it. I also talked to this, uh, the guy, I think he helped launch people, people magazine, um, Landon Jones. And in his book about celebrity, he talked about how people magazine had this strategy called swarming. He said it was very hard to get information about the British Royal family. And, and they were sellers that, you know, everybody would grab a copy of that physical magazine when you had a scoop on the British Royal family. So he said they would do something called a swarm where if they knew that the Royal Ascot was coming up, they'd send 30 30 people to the Royal Ascot to hover and to just, you know, just to listen and to just, you know, cut. I mean, he said they would send it, they called it swarming and they would send an entire team of people to an event or a place where they knew the British Royal family would be or people that associated that were, with them were going to be. So it's like, it's not just somebody hacking your phone, Harry. There is some kind of creepy journalism involved as well. Exactly. And, and, and that's not to say because there was a ton of phone hacking going on or whatever. Yeah. And the people that Harry uh, is on, you know, was sued with and the other people, they actually have a have a case. But Harry doesn't. And yeah. because it's it's not from that. And that's part of the reason that he hasn't been victorious. But I think he's just feels so persecuted and stuff. And at some point he just plays the victim game so much. And it's like, Harry, stop being a victim, you know, you know, start living your life and stop right. living back in 1997 and just. I agree. Yeah. He has a beautiful family and a really, he's got, he's been given some incredible opportunities here. And T, oh my gosh, what a pleasure to talk to you. I had no idea that I was going to have so much fun talking to you about the British Royal family because you on your website, you cover everything. I mean, you're talking about every A-lister, anybody who's anybody. Obviously I get excited when I see the big reveals because I get to know if I'm right or wrong about some of your blind items, but to have so much fun talking to you about the Royal family, I'm so grateful for your time today and for anybody that's unfamiliar how can people keep up with you what are what are your favorite ways for people to follow you crazydaysandnights.net is the website it's 365 days a year and then i'm at nt lawyer on all social media platforms and then my patreon it's patreon.com slash nt lawyer and there's probably a hundred hours of harry and megan on there something love like it that. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I cannot wait to get this up because this has been one of my favorite conversations. Well, great. And thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And say hi to your mom. I will. Yeah. I'm definitely going to do that. All right. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.